it's next to the between the tooth and the gum tissue that leads to inflammation and that inflammation causes the vascular engorgement which ultimately leads to bacteremia so you can see the bacteria getting into the blood going to the rest of the body also you can have localized inflammation and those inflammatory mediators lead to systemic inflammation and ultimately um, periodon periodontal disease or periodontitis is associated with adverse outcomes in multiple organ systems, including atherosclerosis, stroke, colon cancer, increased risk for diabetes and obesity. But the one we're going to speak about today is specifically pregnancy outcomes. But also what's kind of a catch-22 is pregnancy also inherently increases the risk for periodontal disease. And we know that pr pregnant people with pre-existing periodontal disease actually have worsening of their probing depths and bleeding gums during pregnancy, and this resolves after birth. And we really don't know why this happens, although it appears to be related to changes in estrogen and progesterone hormones that fluctuate during pregnancy. But in order to determine the relationship of periodontal disease with preterm birth, um, we first need to know how does preterm birth occur. And so I have on the slide, you can see preterm parturition syndrome. That's the other term for preterm birth, and you'll, you'll understand why. So we really don't know exactly the reason that, or the mechanisms leading up to preterm birth. It's supposed or a theorized that it's either an early initiation of the same processes that occur at term, just early, or it's an abnormal series of signaling pathways. But whichever mechanism it is, we do know that there's a vast majority or a lot of different things that can lead to preterm birth, including infection, ischemia, uterine overdistension. Uterine overdistension is why multiples like twins and triplets tend to deliver early and all of these other things on the slide. And all of these have the common pathway, if you will, of leading to preterm birth, which is why it's been termed preterm parturition syndrome. But I, we're going to speak specifically today about infection because periodontal disease is, by definition, infection and resulting inflammation. So now we're going to talk about infection, and I also put dysbiosis on the slide. And I just want to point that out. To me, I'm using those terms, you'll hear them somewhat interchangeably, but inter infection in my mind also includes some elements of inflammation. And dysbiosis, in my opinion, could just be a change in the microbiome without resulting inflammation. And so that I put those uh, on purpose as distinct terms here. But what's the relationship of infection with preterm birth? Well, this is just one of many studies in which they looked at pregnant individuals who had ruptured membranes, their water broke in early, and then they looked at those who had contractions, which is a sign of preterm labor, versus those without contractions. And they looked specifically in the amniotic fluid, that water, if you will, to look for signs of bacteria. And in the, um, the individuals who had preterm labor, those with contractions, there was much higher rates of lipopolysaccharide, which is bacterial endotoxin, a component of the gram-negative cell membrane, and this really suggested that infection is a part of the preterm birth pathway. And also, my research mentor at Baylor, Dr. Shirsty Agard, a maternal fetal medicine expert, discovered that the human placenta has a sparse but present uh, microbiome that seems to be most associated with the human oral microbiome. And this is surprising because many people for many years have thought that the womb is, quote unquote, sterile. And while this evidence is not conclusive, the bacteria present appear to be most associated with the oral microbiota. And the thought is, is that the oral microbiota seeds the human placenta during episodes of transient bacteremia. And just know, like, every time we brush our teeth, we get transient bacteremia. So this is not like an uncommon thing. Everybody has it. And so this is the thought that it occurs. And don't take the me method or message, don't brush your teeth, you should brush your teeth. But um, thus, the womb may not actually be sterile, and there may be a low abundance microbiome present within the placenta that is most similar to the oral microbiome. And dysbiosis of the placental microbiome or the associated oral microbiome may actually contribute to preterm birth. But the next thing then to talk about, we just talked about infection and dysbiosis, but what about inflammation independent of that? Well, during pregnancy, there's actually a relative anti-inflammatory state. And this is because the fetus has different antigens than the mother. And so the, the body needs to dampen down those inflammatory pathways so it doesn't attack the fetus so the fetus can grow and develop normally. 
And so, but then around the time of delivery, there's actually an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines and that leads to contractions and that leads to delivery. But how does this relate to preterm birth and pregnancy outcomes? Well, one study evaluated gestational tissue such as the placenta and signs of inflammation in relationship to adverse pregnancy outcomes. And what they found is that sterile inflammation in the gestational tissues, meaning there weren't bacteria, just signs of inflammation, were present in relationship to early pregnancy or preterm birth, uh, growth restriction, and so on. And so once again, it, it suggests that inflammation is also associated with preterm birth and adverse pregnancy outcomes. So putting it all together, maternal infection, placental dysbiosis, and systemic inf inflammation are associated with preterm birth and growth restriction of the newborn. And so this is my way of kind of putting everything together. And how does this relate to periodontal disease? Well, we know that dysbiosis of the oral microbiota is a key part of the pathway leading to periodontal disease. And that leads to local inflammation, which in turn leads to the gum erosion and the tooth resorption, and that's periodontal disease. And that also, that inflammation leads to vascular engorgement and permeability, which ultimately leads to bacteremia. That leads to seeding of the placenta, which could be a trigger for preterm birth. But independent of that, periodontal disease can lead to systemic inflammation, once again, completely independent of the dysbiosis, and that can lead to preterm birth. So really kind of multiple different pathways leading to preterm birth through maternal periodontal disease. We're going to come back to this in the future. So while that's my theory, what does the evidence actually show? Well, periodontitis during pregnancy is associated with preterm birth. And Steve Offenbacher through UNC was one of the first to show this with a publication in 1996, and subsequent systematic reviews and meta-analyses have shown nearly two to three-fold increased risk of preterm birth in pregnant people with periodontal disease during pregnancy. So a natural question becomes, does treatment of periodontitis during pregnancy actually prevent preterm birth? Well, over 11 randomized controlled trials have been performed looking at this exact question. And the traditional treatment of periodontal disease involves dental scaling and planning, which this is a little gif of. Essentially, you take a pick and you pull out the plaque. It's also pro-inflammatory and it causes bacterial seeding. And while they didn't actually show any harm with that, it actually didn't cause any benefit. It didn't prevent preterm birth, um, but it improved the maternal oral health. And so periodontitis is associated with preterm birth in low birth weight newborns. And the traditional treatment of periodontitis, which is dental scaling and root planning, does not lead to improvements in pregnancy outcomes. So we know the answer, right? Treatment of periodontitis during pregnancy does not prevent preterm birth, or does it? So let's look at actually what the studies did and, and who they enrolled. And they enrolled patients with known periodontitis. We'll come back to that. They also provided the intervention traditionally in the second trimester of pregnancy, the mid-trimester, and they used dental scaling and root planing. And so if you remember this schematic that I showed earlier, actually the most reversible phase is the middle, gingivitis. And once you get to periodontal disease with bone resorption and tooth loss, that's, um, it's much more irreversible at that phase. So maybe the reason of a lack of effect is they because of they're just enrolling patients with known periodontal disease, maybe they enrolled patients too late in the disease progression. Or maybe they enrolled patients too late in pregnancy. Maybe it should have been in the first trimester. Or even what about patients that are trying to get pregnant but aren't pregnant, so we call that periconception. Or are there other treatment options? And I just want to take a quick pause there because dental scaling and planning, I just mentioned this, but that pick is pro-inflammatory. And there's actually been many studies showing that you actually have increases in your cytokines, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, for a month to potentially six months after you do the procedure. And also, some people that have prosthetic heart valves and whatnot have to take antibiotics because it causes bacterial seeding. So it may not be the best intervention on preventing preterm birth. But I also have to say 
the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommend that all pregnant people get screened for uh, having a dental referral on their first OB visit and that they go see a dentist because you do need to treat this. You can't delay it. Um, and those studies that I mentioned didn't show harm. So it is the recommendation to get treated. But put another way, what about earlier treatments, preventive treatments, or alternative treatments? And how do those relate to preterm birth? So this leads us to xylitol. Well, xylitol is a naturally occurring sugar alcohol that's found in birchwood and strawberries and vegetables and uh, chewing gum companies and other even like soda companies and, and whatnot have started really liking it because it's just as sweet as sucrose, but it has 40% less calories. And so in America, we always like things that have less calories. And so it got put into things, but it's actually been found to be beneficial. It actually prevents strep mutans from growing. And strep mutans is the bacteria known to cause cavities or dental caries. It also reduces adhesion of other pathogens, increases salivation, and ultimately reduces those bacteria known to cause dental caries and periodontal disease. And much of the literature had fo has focused on dental caries with xylitol preventing cavities. But more and more literature over time is starting to show that it actually has an effect on preventing periodontal disease. This is just one of many, and this is more of a basic science publication, but they found that xylitol actually prevented the growth of Porphyromonas gingivalis. And Porphyromonas gingivalis is the bacteria associated with periodontal disease. And independent of that, it actually prevented inflammation, damp dampened down that uh, cytokine cascade, that pro-inflammatory cytokine cascade, independent of the inhibition of the growth of porphyromonas gingivalis. So two specific mechanisms there. So if you think back upon that pathway I proposed earlier, how does xylitol potentially impact that? Well, the xylitol prevents the dysbiosis of the oral microbiota. It's actually considered a prebiotic because it prevents those bad bacteria from growing and it helps the good bacteria. It also dampens down the local inflammation independently, the NF-kappa B signaling pathway and all of that that pathway. And ultimately it prevents periodontal disease. So thinking about this and putting it all together, a xylitol based chewing gum is known to improve oral health and adverse oral health conditions are associated with preterm birth. So does chewing xylitol based gum in pregnancy prevent preterm birth? So it's kind of like a crazy thing, chewing gum in pregnancy and preventing preterm birth. Like who would have thought? So uh, we're going to talk about that. But in order to think about a study addressing that specific question, we first need to find the location to do a study for that. And so ideally, it's a place where they have the highest rate of preterm birth in the world and also high rates of periodontal disease in pregnant people. So what is the country with the highest preterm birth rate? Well, it's Malawi, and nearly one out of five pregnancies um, in fact, this is March of Dimes data from 2010 showing 18%. There's even some publications showing up to 29% of pregnancies have preterm birth. So it's very high and people don't know why. Um, and if you're curious, the United States was 54th in, um, back then in 2010. It's, our percentage has come down from 12 to nearly about 10% of pregnancies now. But why does Malawi have the highest preterm birth rate in the world? Well, we don't know. And neighboring countries like Zambia, Mozambique, and Tanzania, they don't have as high of a rate as, as Malawi. Um, but it becomes an optimal location to evaluate therapies aimed at preventing preterm birth. And so ultimately, Malawi has this high rate of preterm birth. On one of my first slides, I mentioned we know, and we did a cross-sectional study, that nearly 77% of pregnant women or recently postpartum women had signs of gingivitis or periodontal disease in, in Malawi. And there's also just limited access to running water, toothbrushes, things like that. So it becomes an optimal location to study xylitol and do an interventional trial on the prevention of preterm birth, which leads us to the PPACS trial, which stands for the Prevention of Prematurity and Xylitol Trial. So the hypothesis of the PPAX trial was that daily xylitol chewing gum use starting periconception and continuing throughout pregnancy would significantly reduce periodontal disease in preterm birth along with low birth weight offspring in an at-risk population. 
So we conducted a cluster randomized trial in Malawi seeking to determine whether xylitol chewing gum use would significantly reduce preterm birth and low birth weight offspring, and whether there would be a parallel reduction in maternal periodontal disease. And we defined preterm birth as less than 37 weeks and low birth weight as less than 2,500 grams. And we also looked at not only just periodontal disease, but dental caries in the mothers. So this is a map of Malawi. It's a beautiful country. Um, pretty much a, a very large lake called Lake Malawi goes from north to south. And the capital is Lilongwe. And so we performed a cluster randomized trial, which if anybody has questions at the end, we can discuss why we chose that. But we um, chose eight different health uh, districts and community hospitals for our cluster randomized trial in and around the capital of Lilongwe. So we had four of the health centers that were our control, and then four were intervention. And in the intervention group, they, those pregnant people that received care there received xylitol chewing gum and were instructed to chew two pieces a day, one after breakfast, one after dinner for 10 minutes at a time. But all centers, even those in the control group, received access to dentists, to screenings at the dentist, um, also education. And so really, it, that control group should be considered an active comparator because they actually received a little bit more uh, resources than the general population. The inclusion criteria were they had to be 18 years or older, they had to be uh, pregnant in less than 20 weeks or not pregnant, but planning to be pregnant in the next 18 months, willing to undergo two uh, periodontal exams, plan to deliver at a health center where they were enrolled, speak English or Chichewa. Chichewa, those are the two native languages in Malawi, and also willing to chew gum if they're in that group. The exclusion criteria were those that did not meet the inclusion criteria and were cognitively not able to provide informed consent. So we were really excited that we enrolled over 10,000 pregnant people in Malawi. This went from 2014 to 2018. And um, because it was a cluster trial, you can see that we, we randomized by center. So we had about 4,500 that received um, the gum and 5,500 that did not uh, were in the control. But what I'm really excited about is that 96% of patients followed up. Uh, that's a pretty impressive thing in most studies, especially with 10,000 patients. And so we're really excited about that. So this is kind of the money slide. Uh, and our, we're really excited about it. Xylitol use in pregnancy led to a significant 24% reduction in preterm birth, which is found to be most significant in late preterm, the 34 to less than 37 week group. But for those that do global health, you're like, oh, gestational age, it's so notoriously hard to figure out gestational age in, in low resource settings. Not, they don't always have ultrasounds. So is there another way we can confirm our findings? Well, we can look at birth weight. So if we can find that the birth weight less than 2,500 grams was also significant, it probably shows that there's a true finding. And lo and behold, um, when we looked at less than 2,500 grams, there was a 30% significant reduction in low birth weight offspring in those who had xylitol-based chewing gum. And so we're very excited by that. Now, how does this relate to maternal periodontal disease? Well, there, in the xylitol group, there was a significant reduction in maternal periodontal disease. There was not a significant reduction in dental caries. And we can also, if anybody has questions about that, we can go through that. But super exciting that xylitol led to the reduction in maternal periodontal disease, preterm birth, and low birth weight offspring in Malawi by simply chewing some gum. But what's the cost? Well, if you or I were to go buy this at a convenience store here in America or on Amazon or wherever, it costs about eight cents a piece. And if you chew that for twice daily for 37 weeks, like what we did in the PPEX trial, that's about $41 per person. And these numbers come, once again, like if you or I to go, go buy this, that it costs one cent to make a piece of gum and they charge eight cents. And so a Ministry of Health might be able to get this much cheaper by buying in bulk, right? So this is like the highest price point. Um, and so what is the number needed to treat to prevent one preterm birth? Well, it's not, you have to look at the number needed to treat, which is you have to treat 26 pregnant people to prevent one preterm birth or 25 pregnant people to prevent one low birth weight offspring. So that ends up being about $1,000 for an entire pregnancy to prevent one preterm birth, which is really an exciting phenomenon. Like it's pretty amazing. 
Um, for instance, there's really only other one thing in, in the United States that they give to prevent preterm birth, and that's progesterone shots, which costs $2,000 a shot. And they do it multiple times in pregnancy. So this is a pretty exciting finding that we have. But why preventing preterm birth is an important thing? Well, preterm birth is the leading cause of death for all children under age five worldwide. Nearly over a million children die from preterm birth complications every year. So anything that reduces preterm birth is, has, is just an amazing thing. But why are our findings different than previous studies? Well, we started preconception. So they didn't have to be in their second trimester to receive an intervention. In fact, some of them were not even pregnant at the time, but planning to get pregnant. Also, they didn't have to have periodontitis to be enrolled in the study. And we didn't use dental scaling and planing. We used xylitol, which is a prebiotic and likely doesn't cause increases in inflammation or bacterial seeding. And so this is our group for, from the Baylor Malawi team. This was, um, so Shirsty Agard, as I mentioned, I'll, um, she was the PI of this, run through Baylor College of Medicine Children's Foundation Malawi. I was very privileged to be a part of this in my fellowship and have continued it on as a faculty here. Um, and these are our community health workers and dentists and some of the sites that we worked at. And also, I have to give posthumous acknowledgement to Dr. Peter Kazimbe, who was the director of the Baylor uh, Malawi Children's Foundation, also a neonatologist, one of the only ones in the country, and really was instrumental in, in the conduct of the PPAX trial. And also, of course, Dr. Shirsty Agard, this is her idea, and she's an MFM doc down at Baylor, and uh, she was the PI of the PPAX trial. But the next question is, now that we know that we prevented preterm birth, we must ensure that the children not only survived, but thrived, free of neurodevelopmental delay. Because it would be not a good thing if they survived the, the immediate newborn period, but then they had severe neurologic deficits later on, or maybe xylitol caused some profound problems. Unlikely, but we have to make sure. And so we are performing the PDAX trial the Prevention of Developmental Delay in Xylitol Study, which is a follow-up to the PPAX trial. And I'm excited that um, this was something that uh, I received a K-23 from, and also Thrasher Research Fund has funded it as well. And so we want to make sure that there's no long-term harm, but we also know that fetal exposure to maternal infection and inflammation during pregnancy is associated with adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes. This is one publication among many and this is actually including researchers from the University of Washington, that looked at over a million Swedish-born children from birth through age 41. And they found that fetal exposure to any maternal infection, severe maternal infection, or even a maternal urinary tract infection during pregnancy, had significantly increased risk of having a child with autism or depression. And there's been many other studies, like in rats and mice, and showing inflammation during pregnancy and fetal exposure associated is changes in the hippocampus and things like that. And so, I mean, it's very, very well biologically plausible that infection and inflammation during pregnancy leads to adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes. So by preventing and treating periodontal disease, which we showed we prevented it in the PPAX trial, it's actually possible that the fetus had less exposure to infection and inflammation. So the hypothesis is that actually gestational use of xylitol chewing gum may have actually independent of the prevention of preterm birth improved the neurodevelopmental outcomes of the children. So that's the premise of the PDAX trial, which is to a follow-up of a thousand randomly selected children that are now aged five to eight that were born during the PPAX trial. And we're going to evaluate the neurodevelopmental outcomes of the children um, comparing xylitol chewing gum exposure to no xylitol chewing gum exposure. And we're looking at six different neurodevelopmental outcomes and tests. And so we're going to look at the cognitive, their executive functions, social emotional, gross motor, fine motor, and language. And the various names of the tests that we're using are, are there in the parentheses. But I, I would be remiss to sit with if I didn't say that neurodevelopment is more than just cognitive. It's about how a person speaks or walks or talks or these types of things, their executive functions, their planning. And so in order to get a more holistic view of a child, you have to think about all of these domains rather than just the cognitive. But there's a critical need. There's no neurodevelopmental test that evaluates the majority of these domains among five to eight-year-old children that's also culturally adapted to low and middle-income countries. 
So these are the tests that we're using in our study, the PDAX trial. And I just tried to um, put together the domains and the age ranges. And so you see on the left, you have the IDELA, the MDAT, the EF touch, which stands for executive functions, the touch, the Kaufman KABC2, the AMECD, anchor items and measuring early childhood development, and then the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. But what you can see is that pretty much all of them, except for just two, go only up to age six. And then the two that go past age six only look at really just one domain. Either the Kaufman looks at cognitive and strengths and difficulties only looks at social emotional. So what about those seven and eight year olds? Like, is there a good test for that? Well, there really isn't. And so we, we've created this battery and we're going to look at that. And so the MDAT is one of the two that we'll talk about just briefly, and it stands for the Malawi Developmental Assessment Tool. It was created based upon the Denver screener, it goes up to age six, culturally adapted as the name suggests to Malawi, and it's cheap. I mean, it's free online source, but you just have to buy the, the kit, which uh, it's not actually you buy a kit. You, it says go buy some blocks and buy some wood sticks and these things, and you, so it costs about $50 to just buy those things at a market. And it's easily transportable. It's just a basket that you can carry in your car wherever. Minimal training is required. Community health workers can use it. And if something breaks, you just go to the market and buy another one for a few dollars. And so it measures gross motor, fine motor, language, and social. And so I spent uh, uh, the last week of January, all of February, and the beginning of March, so about six weeks in Malawi, hiring and training our staff on these. And so um, on the... Uh, Left here is Edith. She's actually a master trainer. She's not part of our team. We hired her as a consultant. She's a research nurse from Blantyre, which is a city in the south, who actually is part of the creation of the MDAP. And she's here teaching our team. And so you can see that this is GIFT and this is Salkani, and they're two of our community health workers. And they're doing role play. GIFT is supposed to be the parent and Salkani is the child. This is doing some fine motor skills. And so this is actually a video of them practicing and learning the MDAT. Um, and you'll hear them speak in Chichewa. That's another part of this is that it all has to be adapted to the local languages as well. <laughs> and so what's, what also is um, important is, as I mentioned, and a very key rigorous part of this is that we have six community health workers on our team. So they all have to learn how to do this with the exact same phrasing and, and they have to know how to do it for inter-rater reliability. So they all have to do it the same and they all have to score it the same. And so that's why it takes so many months to get this up and running. This is another video of them just working on more of a social skill. So this is them actually now Tabanecho, who's another community health worker here, um, is acting as the parent, Gift is the child, and Salkani is now the assessor. Edith is checking them off, making sure they're doing it correctly, and there's a few others in the back, and they're going to ask Gift to sing a song uh, showing social skills. <laughs> And they just go through, and there's, very, and there's the four different domains, as I mentioned. That's the MDAP. Super easy. I also have to point out, they're sitting on the floor. And that's a, a purposeful thing. Most places in rural communities and low-resource settings do not have chairs and tables. So sitting on the floor is, is a culturally adapted thing. And in fact, you, you're supposed to do that with the MDAP. And so this contrasts with the Kaufman. So the Kaufman looks like something that we do here in America, and it is something that we can do here in America. It's these flip books, um, as you can see on the screen. And this is used for children up to age 18, and it assesses cognitive outcomes, and it takes about an hour to do. But it's really expensive. It costs about $2,500 for the kit. It requires extensive training. Actually, you can't buy it unless you're a psychologist. And if a supply breaks, like those flip books, those flip books, each one is $400. Um, and you have to score it officially on an official scorebook, which each one of those costs $3. So $3 per patient is it's a lot of money, especially in low resource settings. And so these are some pictures of us working on training. And once again, Edith is a trainer in this. So you'll see Edith over here. And then you see our team in the two groups right here. 
Tabernacho is acting as an assessor. You can see the flip book. Salkani is acting as the child. But um, this is them practicing that. And this is another view of it, um, of our team. And this is one of the tests that is called Rover. It's an executive function kind of planning, pre-planning. And so they have a little dog that they have to get to a bone, and they have to do it in the fewest number of moves as possible. So if you do it in four moves versus five moves versus six moves. But it's actually a challenge, even in low resource settings, because they don't always have some of these same kind of thought processes or games, like puzzles. There's like no puzzle that I could find in Malawi. So what we, like a five piece puzzle is challenging even for my community health workers to complete. Um, and, and it took them some time to learn these skills. So this is Tabanacho doing Rover. And you can see that it's challenging for her, but she loved it. And um, it'll be challenging for the children too. So she's counting, trying to figure out how to get the dog to the bone in the fewest number of, of moves. And she doesn't know I'm recording. And she gets really excited when she sees me recording. <laughs> But um, yeah, and so it was fun. But ultimately, the questions are, can the MDAT itself, I mean, it only goes to age six. So I'm working with Melissa Gladstone, the creator of the MDAT. The question is, could it actually screen for severe neurodevelopmental delay among children all the way up to age eight? I mean, that would be fantastic. And we'll be able to assess that with all the other tests that we're doing. And is there an optimal neurodevelopmental testing battery for children up to age eight in Sub-Saharan Africa? we'll be able to look at that. But these are the other questions that we hope to answer. Did xylitol use actually prevent neurodevelopmental delay? That's the key question. We're also getting hearing and vision screens on every child, so we can also look at that and how that influences their outcomes as well. Were there differences in offspring in maternal oral disease? All the children and the mothers will come back in at five to eight years after the PPAX trial. Also, there's no xylitol gum in Malawi, so they can't have it otherwise. And we're going to look at their oral health. There's actually studies in Scandinavia that children exposed to maternal xylitol use in pregnancy didn't have dental caries at four to five years of age, even if the child never chewed xylitol gum. Also, we're going to look at the oral microbiome. We're, check, we're taking specimens from the mom and the child uh, at five to eight years of age. And we'll, we have over a thousand variables in our data set, and we'll be able to assess that with all the neurodevelopmental outcomes. So then the next step, step is a domestic study. How would xylitol chewing gum impact preterm birth and neurodevelopmental delay in patients at UW in, in the United States? Well, let's study it and find out. So this is the ADAPT study, the accessibility of dental care among pregnant patients. And I'm working with two of the MFM fellows, um, both first years and finishing up their first year, Dr. Carolina Martinez-King and Dr. Charlie Rose, and they've been doing a great job. What we found out ACOG, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, recommends that we're supposed to screen all pregnant patients at the first OB visit for needing a referral to dental care. But we, when I started asking what is our rate of referral and these things, we, I quickly found out that we were not having an active screening process. We screened 0% of our patients. So that led to a quality improvement project. And that's the quality improvement project of the ADAPT study with a smart aim of improving our screening to more than 60% of our pregnant patients. It's ideally supposed to be 100, but uh, we're gonna go for a more realistic greater than 60% over the next six months. And ACOG recommends that if you don't have your own screening questions, they give you these three to, to use. So do you have swollen or bleeding gums, a toothache, problems eating or chewing food or other problems in your mouth? Has it been more than six months since you last saw a dentist and do you need help finding a dentist? And if you answer yes to any of the three, it's considered a positive screen. And so what we created is an algorithm where if they screen positive and they have their own dentist, they, then we refer them back to their dentist. But if they don't have their own dentist or can't afford their own dentist, then we found that Shoreline Dental Hygiene Program has free and reduced services and accepts Medicaid and Apple Care or Apple Health. And actually, it's kind of a misnomer. Shoreline Dental Health uh, Program is at, or Hygiene Program is actually at the UW Montley campus, just down the, the road, or not just down the hall from the MICC, the Maternal Infant Child Care Clinic. And it provides really reduced cost services, and it also helps train dental hygienists. 
And so that's the quality improvement project. But what I also then realized is that there's really not a great screening questionnaire to identify pregnant people at risk for periodontal disease, even just adults, let alone pregnant people in America. So we can do that with our referral process. Um, and these are just some publications of looking at screening uh, surveys in other contexts. And most of them are actually from outside the United States. And really, none of them are in pregnancy. So there's actually limited data on validation of periodontitis screening in pregnancy, especially in the United States. So we'll be able to do that as part of our research part of this. So the initial part was quality improvement. And then we go into a research study. And we'll also be able to track how they answer the questions and in relationship to their pregnancy outcomes. And then finally, the MOXIE trial. So Dr. Carolina Martinez-King, who was also on the ADAPT study, um, she, she is an MFM fellow and she's helping us with, um, she's actually leading as a PI, the mechanisms of xylitol and pregnancy trial. And so she, this week, submitted an early career thrasher. We're hopefully, we're crossing our fingers that gets funded. And that would essentially start looking at the mechanisms of how does xylitol actually work? And it, it would be a feasibility pilot study. So that way it sets the groundwork for doing a domestic study here at the University of Washington. So in conclusion, maternal oral disease is associated with preterm birth. Xylitol chewing gum use in pregnancy prevents preterm birth in Malawi, which was through the PPAX trial. Next, we need to determine that there's no neurodevelopmental harm in offspring based upon xylitol exposure, which is the PDAX trial. Also, as part of the PDAX trial, neurodevelopmental assessments should be culturally adapted but are difficult to find for children aged five to eight, especially in low and middle income countries. And neurodevelopmental assessments should assess more than just cognitive outcomes. And trials are needed in the United States. So let's do one here. Hopefully through the MOXIE trial, we'll set the groundwork for that. And finally, we need to improve access of dental care um, of our own obstetric patients, which is a health disparities and health equity issue that we're currently facing. And that's through the ADAPT study. Some people ask, like, why do we do a cluster trial design? And I think that's an important part of, of figuring out research. So whenever you do a cluster randomized trial, it's really important for nutritional based studies. So an individual randomized trial, you, it's easy. You, you randomize based upon the individual, right? And so that's a traditional trial that we all know and love and learned about. But a cluster randomized trial, you, you randomize based upon the health center or health district or hospital level. And there's a reason for that because think about it. Like if you have chewing gum and I have chewing gum right here and there's a person right here who has no chewing gum and they're maybe in my same household or whatnot, I'm going to be like, do you want to share? Do you want, do you want some of my chewing gum? So not only would that reduce my amount of chewing gum that I'm consuming, which I need for the dose for my effect, and that would minimize my effect. But what if that person is actually in the same trial? What if there's two pregnant people in the same household, which can happen, especially in low resource settings? And then you actually have contamination between the groups. And so um, it, a cluster randomized trial is really important for nutrition based research in low resource settings, as well as in um, supplementation based research. And it prevents that treatment contamination between groups. And also the nice thing about a cluster trial is that it improves external validity because you're actually in increasing kind of the breadth of where you're enrolling multiple health centers across an area, not just one health center. So that increases external validity. This is phenomenal. Okay. <laughs> um, it looked like, uh, looking at your numbers real quickly, that roughly a third or a quarter, uh, you could decrease the rates of preterm or low birth weight. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? And this is a relatively urban population around the long way. It's, it's I would say, yes, there, we had a mixture of urban, rural, and semi-urban, semi-rural, and from each of the clusters, but yes. I guess my, my theme that I'm getting towards is that there's multifactorial mm -hmm. reasons for preterm and low birth weight, right? Um, some of it's oral inflammation, some of it's enteric inflammation, some of it's vaginal inflammation, some of it's uh, yeah. you know, undernutrition of the mother that she has mm -hmm. had since childhood or, or adolescence. Or, so I, I wonder if in different locations, the contribution, the percentage contribution, so to speak, of the oral uh, mm -hmm. inflammation is different, right? If you're in a very urban, relatively middle class mm -hmm. to upper class for that context setting, or even here, it might be a smaller, it might be a bigger mm -hmm. component but you go more and more rural and there's more pathogens and mm -hmm. more inflammation and more malnutrition, undernutrition for these uh, pregnant folks. I, I wonder if you, do you see any difference between rural, urban, um, and, and, and then uh -huh. trying to replicate this in a very rural area where there's more 
pathogens? So to yeah, speak? it's a good question. Um, and I think we can look at it based upon each specific health center, but even with that, there's going to be within each cluster, there's a, like comparing a cluster to a cluster is, is going to be hard to do um, just because of inherent differences there. But yeah, I think that absolutely, um, I th where, where you're getting at is we need to do this in other populations. And I think not just in the United States, but in other low resource settings and in really rural areas and whatnot. And, and I think that we need to make sure that these findings are generalizable for sure. You go rural, they have more malaria. You go mm -hmm. close to the lake, they have more schistosis. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. What is the relative contribution to preterm birth and does the effect increase or decrease? I think you could almost make an argument either way there. But yeah, it's good. Uh, thanks for just an amazing uh, talk, uh, eye-opening uh, at the least. Uh, has anyone ever done a uh, burden of uh, uh, inflammatory cytokines or burden of endotoxin over time during pregnancy? to establish a dose response effect. That would be very powerful statistically uh, if you could do that. And I, has anyone ever done that? Because there are pretty easy tools now that don't, don't take much blood uh, to look at that question. Thank you. Is that in response, or specifically with regards to xylitol? Uh, first establish if there is a dose response uh, effect so uh, in terms of risk for premature birth, and then what is the effect of an intervention? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I believe that has been done. Um, I can't quote the literature off the top of my head, but I know that there's uh, actually at PAS, this, there's uh, people here um, doing research on how inflammation and increasing amounts of inflammation in cytokines relates to this corticotrophin releasing hormone that's produced by the placenta, which is considered the placental clock, which ends up leading to preterm birth. So I do think that there is literature out there. I, um, I don't know the exact dosing per se, but the latter part of that question is essentially a big need, which is, does is first of all, what is the mechanism of xylitol? Is it actually preventing the dysbiosis? Is it preventing inflammation? Is it both? Um, and how does that impact? So I think that's a, absolutely a question that needs to be asked and hopefully can be funded. Um, and that's part of Carolina's work. She's focusing on the microbiome, but the whole other arm of that needs to be an inflammatory cascade arm and seeing how that impairs and dampens it down or does not. Um, the other part of that is dosing. So the PPAX trial was underdosed in my opinion. So we actually found out with literature that has come out more recently with systematic reviews that the optimal dose of xylitol is actually supposed to be five to, over five grams, five to six grams. So Spry, the, the gum that was donated for the PPAX trial, not giving anything saying to use Spry or any specific types of gum, but um, it only has about I think it's about 0.9 grams of xylitol in a piece of gum, and they chew two pieces a day. So that's really just like just under two grams a day, and we saw an effect. So then the next question is, is what about doing the more optimal dosing of six grams? So that's actually what we proposed in Carolina's early career thrasher is to do a six grams here in a U.S. population to maybe see that we'll have an effect here. But those are things that need to be accessed specifically with the microbiome and inflammatory cascade too. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This is always very interesting to hear. Um, so I had a question about like policy. I mean, this is a low risk type of intervention, right? So you don't want to wait 10 years to find out every different mechanism if you're getting some possible benefit mm -hmm. that could help in low, uh, low um, resourced communities as well, you know, here and abroad. So if you were able to make a policy, I'm trying to figure out with, you know, somebody say I'm pregnant and then give them a box of you yeah. know, enough gum to last 10 months or well, how, what kind of policy, what would you see happening um, to Perfect. help with this? I think it's a great question. And I think it gets to how do we roll this out? Right. And I think, so one of the first things is that we need to just start involving the ministry of health, which we have. So they were aware of this trial, but I think the big thing is, is we need to make sure that there wasn't long-term harm with the children. And I think, since this is the first of its kind in a study, like most studies, a lot of studies that are done in low resource settings first kind of have a basis in high resource settings and then they go like cooling or something like that, right? Um, or even antenatal corticosteroids. So those things were first in high resource and then they went to low resource settings. And, and this is more, we're first doing it in a low resource setting. So this is all new science. So we first need to make sure there's no harm, which hopefully with our PDEX trial, if that's successful, that would show 
And then uh, the question is, is I think at that point, if there's no long-term harm, then it should be rolled out, especially in Malawi. And we've already started involving the Ministry of Health. Um, in fact, in October, when I, uh, I have two more trips planned this year, one in June and one in October, they've asked me to speak at the large national conference to start telling them about the results of PPACs. And then the questions are, how do we roll this out? And so I think over the next four years of the PDAX trial, we're going to start hopefully laying the foundation to get that into more of a policy and advocacy framework for larger rollout. Thank you. Thank you for your lovely presentation. I had a couple quick questions. Um, besides the the graph that you showed us that showed Malawi was so high, mm -hmm. um, my question is why Malawi? And when you're focusing on these groups of pregnant women, what class are they in? Are they like more of the group that makes higher income? Like, mm -hmm. How am I trying to say it? More wealthy or more of the, like the poor population mm -hmm. of Malawi? Yeah, great questions. Thank you for that. One of the nice things about our study is that even though it was in and around the long way, there was a large mixture. And in fact, um, the majority of, of, our indiv of the individuals enrolled in the study did not have even like a stovetop or anything like that. Um, so it was, it was very few and far between that they had a high income. But actually, for the PDAC study, we are collecting, in fact, I got some texts this morning as I was sitting here, um, about checking income level. So we will have that specific information on the 1,000 patients that are following up. But just talking to the community health workers, it was very, very few and far between that they were of higher resource. And you had a first part. Oh, why Malawi? So, I mean, quite honestly... The, the, high, the highest rate of preterm birth, the high burden of periodontal disease, that makes it a great population. But also Baylor had a Baylor Women's Foundation that was part of the Baylor Global Child Health Residence or Global Baylor College of Medicine Children's Foundation Malawi, which has this pediatric AIDS initiative there. And so they had OB services that were there on the ground. And so it just made natural sense that all of these things kind of nicely came together for Malawi. I have some work ongoing right now in Ethiopia, and I think that I would love to do this this trial again in Ethiopia with a better or appropriate dosing. The other part of this is we did not do a placebo, right? So it, is there some effect just of chewing gum? So it would be nice to do a placebo study as well. Number one, it was just a fantastic, super interesting lecture. Thank Very you. exciting. But what was the country that had the best hygiene? You know, you had Malawi oh. at the top and then yeah, I was the, to see that. And we were, we were in the middle. middle, but who had the you best? Know, I don't actually remember off the top of my, I, um, I don't actually remember. I, I do remember. Is it Finland? <laughs> they eat fish or something? Uh, I can't read that. It's I way too small. <laughs> no. I think Latvia is down there, but I don't know which one is the, the I don't know, but I can look into that. Yeah. And then just as an aside, uh -huh. it makes me think that people who are expecting to undergo an elective surgical mm -hmm. procedure, we should all be giving them a pack of gum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was great. Well, thank you so much.